one. This happened some years ago at a job I no longer have in a state I no longer live in. I was reminded of it because of another non-food related contest I am entering today. Some years ago, I worked in an office for a large medical insurance provider that really wanted to unite you with your health and care. As one often runs into in such office environments, there were often morale boosting events, pizza parties, potlucks, etc. One such event was held in the cold winter and as such was themed as a chilly cook-off. These were often an excuse for the office birds to get a free meal and not do their jobs, but I'm nothing if not violently competitive. I also happen to be a decent cook, so I saw it as an opportunity to flex a little. Come cook-off day, I presented my offering along with a dozen or so others. Judging was done by three other staff within the office, not within the circle of the birds. One could purchase a ticket to sample the wares, thereby solving your lunch problem in the process. By the end of the event, my offering was the only one that was empty. The judges, who were publicly known, this wasn't a blind event or anything, all asked me separately what was in my chili, ingredients, processes, etc. It was clear from the office chatter outside of the birds that I was well ahead of the pack. I didn't win. It is at this point, I should note that I have run afoul of the birds before, I don't politic very well. I also have a problem with people that don't want to get their shit done and think it's someone else's problem. I'm very much a, if we all do the job, we all get done faster type. Amish is moving a barn and all that. Safe to say, the birds didn't want yours truly to win, as they'd handed it over to somebody that had widely been branded as... Canned Chili. Okay, I see how it is. I got you. I'm patient. I got time. If there's one thing about the birds, it's predictability. If there's two things about the birds, it's greed. They, of course, want more food and not to work. So they want another event. Chili Cook-Off brought a metric fuckton of free food in. They know I'm damn good at what I do, so of course I get asked if I'm getting down. I want revenge. Y'all robbed me like I don't know. Game on, bitches. I spent the next several days cleaning out every grocery store I could find of every conceivable violently hot pepper I could get. This was in Minnesota, in the middle of winter, so really not that bad. I wasn't getting reapers. I also cooked up some secrets that would put the double whammy on the spice, making sure the birds were gonna pay. I wasn't playing for the win here, I was playing for violence. It should be noted, at no point was I attempting to poison these women, I'm not that guy. Everything I made was completely edible. Really fucking good, in fact. I went with chicken this run, used bacon too, nice, thick, cut, smoky bacon from a butcher. I want to say this batch of chili cost me like $75. It was delicious, and I put all my mojo on it. Toasted spices, roasted peppers, all of it. This wasn't Mr. and Mrs. Tenerman chili. Game day. There were several other competitors again, though sadly not as many as last time. A good friend had been talking smack about some recipe he has, so we did a little cross-promotion sneak preview. He almost died. My chili had turned him beet red, and he had the sweats like a Catholic priest got caught with his hands in an altar boy. I knew it was going to be a good time. Announcements go out, grub line happens. I start hearing the sniffles, see a couple of dab tissues. A fanning here or there, in winter, in Minnesota. Then the birds arrive. I purposely ducked out to not make it too obvious that I was waiting, but I didn't even need to see it. The first Ooh! told me I got one. I knew the rest weren't far behind. Not long after that, I see the judges. Usual questions about my recipe. Truth be told, I don't have one. I never do. I have tricks, I have methods, etc. But it's never the same twice. I'm always playing by ear. Cooking is art, baking is science. One of the judges visibly has tears coming from his eyes, said it was the hottest thing he'd ever eaten. Delicious, but insanely hot. I just kind of go, yeah. 
because I can't really explain that he was collateral damage in a revenge plot. Afternoon email goes out, shorter than the usual winner's announcement. I've been given the win. I like to think it was because my food was superior, and I believe it was, but I am reasonably sure it was out of fear. The Walmart gift card I won didn't cover half the cost of the pot of chili, which was once again stone empty when I got it back. I never did hear how bad Montezuma was with his revenge. They never did have another chili cook-off. I like to think they were afraid of me. Probably just office morale was really bad, but I'll take the win. 2. Now that spooky season is in full swing, I recently got reminded of a story from my childhood about Halloween, and how younger me managed to take some small revenge on my mom. Background. It was Halloween some years ago, I'm not sure which year, but I remember that the day after was a weekend. Which is important for two reasons. One, I could stay up for up to one hour after trick-or-treating was over, and two, I didn't have school the next day. This story. Day zero. After I had finished my trick-or-treating that night, I stayed up a little bit longer than usual to sort my candy. Something my ADHD brain loved doing. I also logged all my candy so I could tell when one of my siblings or parents inevitably stole from my hall. I noted that I had 12 of a specific candy, I think they were Butterfingers, and went to bed. Day 1. After waking up the next day, I noticed that the quantity of said candy was harshly reduced. I believe it went down to 4 pieces out of the original 12 that were there. Through process of elimination, I figured out who the culprit was. My dad was allergic to peanuts. Butterfingers, in case you didn't know, contained peanut butter. My older sister had trick-or-treated and then slept over at a friend's house and wasn't back yet. My older brother was in college. And my younger brother was four months old at the time and was unable to consume solid foods. That meant that the only suspect remaining was my mother. I was angry at her, but I knew better than to take it out on her, because that would only get even more of my candy revoked. So I devised a plan. The plan. I don't know about other places, but where I used to live, our dentist office did a candy buyback, where you would trade in the candy that you didn't like and get money for it. If I recall correctly, the exchange rate is like one dollar per pound of candy. My mother would always force my siblings and I to do this program, and we couldn't exactly say no. So my plan involved me bringing the candy that I knew my mom liked to the exchange. In addition, I managed to get my sister in on it, as we were both tired of her stealing our candy. Day 4. Around four days after Halloween ended, my mother dearest took us to the dentist for our yearly contribution to the candy buyback. Underneath the candy that everyone in the family unanimously hated was the candy my mother absolutely loved. Butterfingers and Reese's Cups, Snickers and Twizzlers, all of that was gone. Gone from both mine and my sister's stashes. It helped that neither of us loved the same candy and that my mother did, aside from me with Butterfingers, but that was a sacrifice I was willing to make. The Fallout now, being a wee kid at the time, I didn't exactly see a juicy fallout, but I do have a clear memory from that year, hearing my mom say to her friends that it was a shame that the kids didn't have any good candy from Halloween this year, and that she was looking forward to it as my sister went to an even larger neighborhood, so she was expecting more candy that she liked. 3. I'm John. I worked in a pizza shop back when I was in college. I worked with Sarah, a vindictive lady who would stir up a lot of drama. Sarah would pick a target and then bully them into quitting. Where I'm at, college students can receive welfare if their parents earn less than a certain threshold. I was ineligible for student support due to my parents' income, even though they didn't support me, and I desperately needed this job. Matt, a new hire, quit after Sarah's harassment. Her attention then turned to me. She would approach my supervisor and spout bullshit like, Hey, Mr. Supervisor, 
I asked John where the snake is, and he said the snake is cutting pizzas. This, while the supervisor was actually cutting pizzas. She would shout at me with extreme hostility. She wouldn't warn me if pans were hot, a major sin in kitchen jobs. She conspired with her friends to accuse me of slacking off, even though they'd never complained about me until Matt quit. This took a toll on me. My hours were cut, impacting both my financial and mental well-being. I even considered dropping out of college because I was struggling to afford rent. Sarah was illegally claiming student welfare despite being employed by the pizza shop. You can only claim the welfare if you are unemployed. Sarah, in the first year of her law degree, was also aspiring to become a lawyer. The thing about being a lawyer is you need to be admitted to the bar to begin practicing. The law industry is very strict. Even proven allegations of plagiarism in college would make one permanently ineligible to become a lawyer. Frankly, she was stupid for defrauding the government. There is an anonymous complaints line for welfare fraud. Most of the time, the welfare department never follows up. Occasionally, however, they would send officials to investigate. This was one of the few times they followed up. I sent an anonymous tip stating the business, her schedule, her name, and her number. I was on shift when some officials from the welfare department came in, informing us that multiple complaints were made against Sarah. I think my boss could have just told them to scram, since they probably didn't have a warrant. But instead of doing that, he licked their shoes, showing them all of the CCTV footage. The officials then questioned Sarah, she panicked, confessing to everything. I felt no sympathy for her. As a law student, she should have known to remain silent. Long story short, Sarah received a suspended sentence which would most certainly disqualify her from becoming a lawyer. She dropped out of college, while I continued working at the pizza shop and eventually graduated with an associate's. I have an alright job now. 4. A few years ago, while I was in school and job hunting, I got an interview at a company for office work, filing, answering phones, setting appointments, etc. I was looking forward to getting an office job instead of retail or fast food. The building had big window walls that overlooked the parking lot, so you could see the cars pulling in and parking. I pull into the lot and park my car. I get out and walk into the office. Now, as I'm walking in, I note that there is a car parked in the handicap space in front of the office. This looks just like mine, I should note. So I walk in and am greeted by the manager who kind of gives me a scowling look. It made me uneasy a little as we walked back to his office. We sit down and he is asking me questions in a bit of a clipped tone. He seems annoyed by my answers and I don't understand what's going on at this point. Finally, he says, Do you always park in handicapped spaces? I'm confused, so I ask him what he means. He goes on a rant about how entitled I am for parking in the handicapped spot at a potential place of employment, and I'm just getting more lost. I asked him what is going on because I didn't park in the handicapped spot, I parked in the lot. He argues with me and says he watched my car pull in and saw me park there. I again told him that I didn't park in the handicapped spot, but the car I walked by in that spot looked similar to my car. He says he knows that he saw me park and get out of the car. At this point, I'm over the whole interview. I knew this would be a clusterfuck of a place to work if this is the guy managing it. Then he goes a step further and says, prove it. I grab my purse and get my keys out. I don't even bother waiting for him and just leave the office. He is jogging after me and hurried outside to stand and wait. His face went from smug arrogance to Pikachu real quick as I walked past the car in the handicap spot. He asked me where I was going as I walked over to my car. Then I turned around and made eye contact as I hit the button on my keys to unlock it and got in. He was starting to walk over to me, calling out that he was sorry about the misunderstanding. But I just put the car in reverse and left. I didn't even make eye contact with him as I drove away. This was my second interview, so the manager knows what I and my car look like. I don't know why he said he saw me. 
I'm assuming it was a lie to get me to admit I did it. I've pondered this many a night. Trust me. 5. Six years ago, just over a year after high school graduation, I, a 20-year-old at the time, was studying in a transition to work program called Nova Employment and just started doing my work experience to build my first work resume. I didn't have any particular success in any jobs until I started working in a tow bar factory where I had impressed my supervisors with how I was cutting and smoothing out the sharp edges of cut tow bars. It's basically just me applying the woodworking class skills from high school to a metalworking job which apparently worked really well as I was well on my way to get an official job there. The boss was very patient, professional, and very helpful with teaching me on how everything worked. And I was well on my way to starting welding as I expressed an interest in it on my lunch breaks. My dad even told me about how my grandfather, who had tragically passed away just six years before, about how he was doing the same thing as his first job, and told me that he's proud of me. But then, about two months later, I got called into the manager's office thinking that I was finally going to be officially hired part-time, but the opposite happened. I was told they can't afford to officially hire me since they're going to sell and shut down their business. It's the work equivalent of it's not you, it's me. Then, once I finished my last day, I was yet again on the Nova employment job hunt, soon after I was officially hired to a job. Great, right? Wrong because while I was job hunting the term me and my old co-workers used to describe cutting and smoothing metal as metal polishing, and there lies a huge misunderstanding in what the Nova Employment Job Agency thought I was doing, since my official first job was working at a fiberglass factory that resided in an old abandoned army base. The first day I was greeted by the man who would be my boss. He seemed nice and professional enough when we first met he also had a massive amount of scar tissue on his right arm, seemingly from a shark attack. Then once the formal introductions and obligatory factory workplace tour was out of the way, I was then handed a bottle and a rag and was told by my boss, Wax polish that fiberglass container. I was extremely confused and understandably felt completely lost on what I was supposed to do, he asked. What's wrong? Do you wax polish and thing? And I said, I don't know how. Don't you wax polish metal? I cut and smoothed out the sharp edges of metal toe bars with a metal grinder. We just called it metal polishing. Because it's easier than metal smoothing. My boss then told me just to finish my job and had brought the Nova employment agent who took me there into his office. I then heard them both having a not-so-inconspicuous loud argument coming from his office that echoed throughout the entire factory, first red flag. Then, after that argument, I was sent home, since the first day was only spent showing me around and to show the boss what I can do. But the very next day, everything started getting progressively worse. I started the day with wax polishing, which was fine, but Soon after, I was cleaning up bins, and I overheard him yelling at other employees for not being efficient enough, even though the factory workers were all entirely comprised of workers with varying disabilities, me included. Second red flag. The next day, I was told to sort tools, and I wasn't able to make heads or tails on what to do and sort. I didn't know what to do, so I kindly asked him if he could teach me and make sure that I am on the same page on what to do, but instead he gets pissed off and frantically sorted for me out of frustration while ranting, Why the fuck did I bother hiring you if I have to do your fucking job for you? He then sends me on to rake the dirt duty on the side of the factory building, which he specifically points out is absolutely filled with snakes, and hands me the rake and sends me off, third red flag. The next morning, after I'm dropping off, I, instead of clocking in to start my shift, walked away to the nearest bus stop, and while waiting for the bus, I had a glorious idea. He wants the job done fine, but I'll do it my way, even if he hates the results. So I head back to work, clock in to start my shift. Oddly enough, he doesn't seem to even know that I was ever late at all, since he's preoccupied with yelling at other employees. So I started sweeping, 
Then he called me over to tell me, go clean the entire bathroom. So I asked him, okay, then where's the mop and bucket? He says, there is no mop and bucket, just use the fire hose and grab a rag. He then showed me where the fire hose was and let me have at it while he moved on to the next employee to yell at. I tried to ask someone if they could help me, but nobody was answering, so I put my hands together and got to work. I set up the fire hose to point outside the bathroom window, so it wouldn't spray everywhere inside the bathroom. But surprise, surprise, as I turned on the fire hose, it not only sprayed everywhere, but it absolutely soaked everything in the bathroom. Toilets, floors, walls, roof, and even the toilet paper wasn't spared. But this was pre-COVID, so it wasn't illegal yet. I was afraid to walk in there at first, since from the outside it sounded like the bathroom was haunted. But when I did go in, I saw the fire hose was flying around everywhere, spraying everything in sight with gallons upon gallons of water like it had come alive. I frantically tried to salvage the situation, but it just kept on getting exponentially worse. So I just gave up and turned off the hose and reeled it back into the wall mount and as I finished my job, I saw that the bathroom was now in such a state that it would make even Leno and Woodley proud. I then had my lunch and proceed like nothing had ever happened, then finish my shift for the day. There's one last day of work, but it's not as particularly eventful as the day before, other than the fact that a significant portion of the workforce didn't even bother coming in for work, which obviously pissed the boss off while being completely oblivious as to why they've dipped and we just painted the fiberglass containers all day, which was pretty chill and easy not to screw up. And while I was painting, I accidentally got bits of fiberglass paint all over my work clothes and in my own hair. Yeah, that's an emergency haircut that I wasn't looking forward to. Fun fact, I still have the beanie stained with bits of fiberglass paint to this day, and the stains are still there. I guess he really loved that factory because the following Monday, Christmas came early, as I was notified by Nova Employment that I was fired, and immediately shouted, Oh my sweet Jesus, there is a god! I could only imagine what kind of look that bastard of a boss had on his face. Absolutely worth the constant verbal abuse that he gave me and my fellow co-workers. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream, episode 309. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please do poke the like button. And if you'd like to get the videos a little bit early, then you can support me for as little as a dollar a month through Patreon, which is linked in the description. You'll also find a link to the Hellfreezer merchandise store to get yourself some amazing Hellfreezer merchandise. And you can make donations during streams and videos just like this one. Well, you don't have to, I do appreciate it. And it's really been helping me out. Okay, let's see. No other business today, I don't think, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... And this one comes from my moderator, Ashley, also known as Potato Puff. What do you call the piece at the end of the loaf of bread? I've heard some people call it the heel, some people call it the butt. I was always raised to call it the outsider, because it's the part on the outside. It's also, that makes some of the best sandwiches. You get one of those, one of the regular slices. Very yummy. Also really good toast. But, maybe you called it something completely different growing up. Why don't you let me know what you think in a comment below. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening and take very good care of yourself.